I just pray that you would move in this building this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do an incredible work in the hearts and the lives of your people. I pray especially for those this morning, Lord, who might be struggling. Maybe those who even have come this morning and don't know you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move. I pray that you would convict. I pray that you would comfort. I pray that you would equip. I pray that you would challenge that we would be able to sing this song in truth. Lord, I'm sure there are many of us that stood this morning and sang, I surrender all, but haven't. There are those that have sung, I surrender all, but have never. There are others that have sung, it is your breath in my lungs, but don't know that. Lord, we live and move and breathe because of you. You are our sustainer. You are our sustenance. You are our power. You are our very lives. And so this morning, as we look into your word, I pray for a a revelation greater than we've seen and known of the power of Jesus unto salvation. Holy Spirit, move amongst us. Quiet in our hearts. Take away the distractions of the world that have been in us this week, all the stuff that is going on that take us from you, that stop us from seeing you, and the even bigger obstacles that stop us from surrendering our lives to you. Take them away. So that this morning in the presence of fellow saints, of others who love you, we would be able to declare in all ways, Jesus is Lord. Lord of all. And I surrender to him. We pray this in that name that is above all other names. The name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So before we even start, I have to apologize to the elders. Sorry, please pray for me too. I cannot see this morning. So I'm struggling a little bit. So if if I don't call you by name, it's because I can't see you. I can see you, Gordon. No. No, I don't think we can hear you. Praise the Lord. And I once read a little, someone sent something out on, on social media and said that, do we realize Yahweh, what it means, and, and that every creature that has breath says Yahweh. God placed the breath, breath in us, the master architect placed his breath placed his breath in our lungs and every time we inhale we go (gasps) (laughs) and you know my late father I saw that I saw that on his dying bed in Johannesburg in the hospital in Johannesburg I said dad you can go now he was just white as a sheet from pain and I said you can go now we release you and I thought he was in a coma and he took the mask off his face and he went yeah and he was gone. And I, then I realized that every creature that has breath, whether they want to or not, they praise the Lord with every breath that they take. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I think we'll, we've shared it with before. When Donay was in England saying goodbye to a brother who was dying of cancer, lung cancer, this was the song I think that was playing. It is your breath in my lungs. And there comes a time for every one of us where God says, that's enough. That is your final breath I bless you with. And then we go to be with him. The challenge this morning is, do we go to him? So as I was saying earlier on, I apologize to the elders. They asked me to preach on giving. I have a sermon on giving there. But I'm not going to share it with you today. See, I want to ask you this morning, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? See, we're all sitting here, and I think every single one of us, whether we saved, recently saved, old saved, or not even saved, Jesus is different, although he works exactly the same in every one of us. I said before, he doesn't have favorites. 
But he works exactly the same way in saving us in every single one of us. But in that salvation, we all recognize him differently. And it's for us to understand who is this Jesus and what does he offer. So in, next weekend, I was going to preach to you because we, we're going we're to di, di, deviate from Matthew just for a few weeks. Next week, I was going to share with you around gospel-centered. And you cannot be gospel-centered if you don't know Jesus. You cannot be Christ-focused if you do not know Jesus. And you cannot be mission-determined without Jesus. See, that is our philosophy or our vision on the wall when you walk in. So I will get to giving elders in the next couple of weeks. But I believe this morning as I was standing at the back, listening to the beginning, even Amanzi, that living water, today was not the day for the sermon on giving. Today was a day for a message that I haven't prepared about Jesus. So all I can talk to you this morning is about Jesus and my relationship with Jesus and what it looks like in you and in me. So I'm saying, this is who Jesus is to me. That story Donna shared, actually not a story, that life thing Donna shared this morning about her heart up was extremely traumatic for our family. When your wife dies three times in three days, it is traumatic on you and on your children. But God is good. This is to, to take our mindset to say, whatever God does is okay, even when it hurts. Enough for me to be driving my car, swearing at God. I was a Christian. I was a pastor already, swearing at God, saying, what are you doing to my family and my wife? We serve you, but you kill my wife. That's that life. But we have such a gracious God that in my car, under the free, on the freeway, under the Beacon Bay Bridge in East London, he said to me, Barry, I am big, but I live in your heart. And that is sufficient for you. That is sufficient for you. I went home, cleaned my mind, cleaned my face, but my kids out of bed went to church and gave a testimony on the greatness of God. It's not about how great I am to share God. It's how great God was to say, I've got this. And if your wife dies, she's not yours. She's not yours. Our children are not ours. Our wives are not ours. Our husbands are not ours. They belong to him. You see, when you change your perspective on who Jesus is, that has to change. That has to change. Coming to Christ, into a relationship with Christ, is the most, I want to say the most simplest, but the most difficult decision to make. It's easy to come into church and meet Jesus. But to walk that journey is difficult. Because it doesn't come easy. We could start from the left, your left, my right, this morning and give testimonies, every single one of us, of how rough life is. But we, could, we should all be able to say how good God is. In our lives. No matter what the struggle, no matter what has happened, we should be able to say Jesus is everything. And so I just wanted to, to share this, this morning just some of the scriptures that were bouncing around. I could talk all day to you. I could start it in the beginning and we finish with amen. It's only 66 books. Won't take long. <laughs> but you see, it's easy to preach 66 books of the Bible because right through the Bible, it's only one thing. Jesus. From in the beginning, there was Jesus. At amen, there was Jesus. In the exact middle of the Bible, that for therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and nothing will separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. There's him. Always. The same God from yesterday is him today and will be forever. Who is Jesus to you? If Jesus came now, where would you go? You see, there is only two places to go. And we can laugh about it and say, you either go up or you go down. That is the choice. You either go to life or you go to death. You either go to eternal glory or you go to eternal damnation. Who is Jesus to you? People get shocked when I say to them, do you know Jesus? No, you're going to hell. How can you say that very easily? Because the book, God's revelation of his love for us in the book says, I love you. And I hate the word but. But if you do not recognize me, there's only one consequence. You see, that, that passage that, that changed my life, even after I'd been saved, the, the, the scripture, all of us probably, even non-Christians can quote the scripture. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's the King James Version, because most of us learned it out of the little Gideon book. We can all quote it, from believer to non-believer, because it used to be hammered into us, the older folk at school. But for many of us, it doesn't hold true. See, we don't know Jesus. We've heard of Jesus. He's a great story. He's a great myth. And for some, he's a great crutch. I'm so glad I have a crutch whose name is Jesus to help me get through. And so when he, when he says that verse, whoever loves him, what he's actually doing is opening this door to you and I to say, if you need help, I'm here. I'm here for you. The thing is, we don't want to see that. So when I got saved and I had to teach a message on how much God loves you, it's difficult for a man who feels unloved and rejected to preach and teach young people what it means to be loved by God. See, God doesn't work in, in, in ways we understand. So when I'm feeling unloved, rejected by my father, I don't have any understanding of what it means to be a, in a father-son relationship, God says to me, I want you to teach on how much I love you, and this is the verse. God changed my life with that simple verse after I got saved. God works in strange ways. So I want to again ask you, who is Jesus to you? Do you understand the simplicity of the gospel? And what it is, we have made the gospel such a complicated and, and diverse thing where it's very easy. It's so easy. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. So if you're going to have anything about the gospel, it has to start at the beginning. I've shared this with our, our holiday club guys so often when I teach them on the gospel. How many of you get a new book? I love reading. How many of you get a new book and the first thing you do is go to the back page? Anybody? Probably nobody. Oh, there are one or two strange people. But generally the anticipation of reading the book is starting at in the beginning, once upon a time. Because we want to read that story. It's part of that journey. So if we're going to understand the gospel, we have to begin with God. And that's, a, that's already the, the stumbling block for so many. Where did God come from? How many of us truly understand what it means to say God has always been there? My brain doesn't work that way. There must be a beginning and an end. But God has always been there. And God created, God created this incredible thing for you and for me called creation. And we are part of that creation. We are part of God's plan for this creation. We have much to answer for, let me tell you, for what we have done to his creation. And he asked us just the, the simple thing, look after it and don't touch that one tree. I know us, I know me. I'm going to touch that tree just to see. And it begins so well. That's why Hebrews talks about when Jesus dies, everything is brought back to what, Jesus, what God created. The fullness of God's creation came back when Jesus died. But God creates this incredible thing, this creation for you and I, and he breathes life into man, us. Every single living being, whether they know Christ or not, as Gordon has shared, breathes because he wills it. Let's not think we, doctors, when, when somebody's heart stops, they can do what they like if God has said it stops. They can do what they like. I'm just so glad that the doctors that worked on my wife knew what they were doing and it wasn't yet time. Because if it was time, it would have been time. They could have shocked her, done anything. I would even say they could have put a new heart in her and it wouldn't have worked. Because God withdrew that time but he didn't God created this incredible masterpiece creation is a masterpiece but you and I are even greater masterpieces just look how we work look how we function look how we live and breathe don't touch one tree that's what I'm asking and they did I wouldn't have created. That's very saying. I'm going to create them. They're going to touch the tree. Everything's going to fall apart. Why create them? 
but he did because he loves us. And that seems strange to people who feel unloved. Because I could say, yeah, now, how many of us are feeling rejected, inadequate, denied, criticized, and you're gonna put your hands up? Probably many of us. Go through life, and then in that life, we're looking for all these other things to satisfy our needs, to satisfy what God has already put into us. The desire for relationship and to be loved. Because God made us. God made us in his image. His image is relationship. His image is love. We should know, by, by triune God, we talk about relationship. Three in one. And we mess it up because we want to be the kings of our own lives. We want to make our own decisions. And unfortunately, many of us get stuck in things that make the decisions for us. Once we go down a certain road, there are things that work in our life that take our responsibility or our decision-making away from us. And then they start making the decisions, and we are slaves to those things. That can be anything. We straight away our minds, when I think for myself, I was becoming a slave to alcohol. Others become slaves to drugs. Others become slaves to sex. Others become slaves to work. They all do the same thing. They separate us from God. And there's, there's always a consequence. Always a consequence to rejection of God. And the worst is that you'll be separated for eternity. What can be worse than that? So we live our lives now and our lives are a mess and we say nothing can get worse than this. Our lives are only this long in eternity. This is nothing. The pain you feel now, the struggle you're going through now is nothing compared to an eternity separated from the presence of God. I shouldn't say the presence because God's going to be in hell too because he's everywhere. But you'll be separated from a relationship with him. Just think about for you. How many of you have lost a loved one? Somebody really, really close that you had a great relationship with. Just think of the agony there is in you right now or then when that loved one passed. That has nothing compared to the agony of a separated relationship from God. Why does Paul write in Romans chapter 5? Since I have loved you so much, before you even knew me, I reconciled you to my father. Because he wanted to bring that relationship back. Because God knows how desperately we need to be in relationship with him and with each other. But there's a consequence to that, that, that sin in our lives. And the consequence of the sin is that we will die. Whether you like it or not, you are going to die. That's a given, unless Jesus comes before then. But the scriptures are very clear. We are destined to die and then to face judgment. Every single one. And you will not stand at the judgment seat and say, but my wife said, Adam tried that. Didn't work. Eve would have tried it and said, the snake did it. Didn't work. We answer for ourselves and we bear the consequence for ourselves. You cannot go to heaven on borrowed faith. You go on your own. Not on your wife's, not on your children's, not on your spouse's, not on your parents'. You go on your own faith. And trust in Jesus Christ alone. And then the, the, the gospel just becomes such a reality to us. When, when God says, I love you, you've messed up, but it's, there's a consequence. And I'm, can I use these words? I'm going to kill you. That sounds harsh. But when God says, heart stop beating, lung squash and do not take in, technically that's what he's doing. Then there's these two choices. Who is Jesus to me? And I want to say to you, when your heart stops and your breathing stops and you're technically dead, it's too late to say, Lord, I love you. Then it's too late. The choice has to be made sooner rather than later for us. I was going to talk a little bit around giving and that this morning, this offering and sacrifice system that God put into place where he put for the, the Old Testament sacrificial system to help with the forgiveness of sin, but killing a beast will not get you into heaven. You know how you get into heaven? You've got to kill yourself. Now, I'm not saying, please, because somebody will say, he said you must do this. No, I'm not. What you have to do is kill your inner man that rejects God. 
You've got to come to that place of Lord, saying, Lord, I surrender all. The words we sing so glibly, but never do. There comes a time where we have to say, Lord, we've messed up. I need you. And God sends this incredible gift, the ultimate sacrifice for every single one of us. Everyone caught in sin, from the richest to the poorest, oldest to the youngest, male to female, black to white, no difference. He sends the same gift to bring salvation to all people. All of mankind is offered salvation. I'm not going to stand here and say to you that people who follow Calvin are right. God offered salvation to everyone, not a select few. So when JWs start talking about 144,000, they've got it wrong. It's offered to all men. Whoever loves me will be saved. That's the challenge. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to me? Have Have I accepted that offer that has been given of salvation? Many of you are saying, yes, I have. The problem is, for many of us, we forget the gospel. We have been Christians for so long, the gospel has just become something that we used to be. I'm saved, so I'm safe. No, you aren't saved to be safe. You're saved to start working. That's why we're going to talk about mission determined later. We are saved to serve Christ. We are saved to serve each other, not to be served. Jesus is the example of that. Whoever loves me, will be saved. Not following Jesus, surrendering to Jesus. Nicodemus. I love the story of Nicodemus. If you've watched the, I can't even think what that show is called now. The Chosen. Oh, there's so many debates. Don't even listen to them on YouTube. Some say it's from the devil itself. Because it's, don't worry. I, I loved it. Because I saw real people struggling with real issues in their faith. And we, know, we don't know if it's biblical, but that one picture where Jesus is talking and Nicodemus is standing around the corner looking and you can see the anguish on his face and the, the distress because he's fighting the challenge of surrendering to Jesus or remaining this Pharisee. And that anguish on his face touched me so, so deeply. And he turns and he walks away and Jesus, the, the actor says, so close. So close. Every one of us, some, every one of us at a time gets so close. And then for circumstance or choice, we turn. Nicodemus scripturally comes to Jesus at midnight. He's afraid of what people are going to say. He's afraid of who might see him talking to Jesus. John 3. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Tell me about the salvation. And Jesus says, Unless you're born of the Spirit, you're not saved. You're born of the water and you're born of the spirit and then you are saved. Every one of us has been born of the water because it's a practical, physical thing. We talk truth in the church. We should. We are saved. We are born when our mom's water breaks. That's a physical act of birth. It's not baptism. It is a physical birth. Every single person on earth who is alive was born by water. Even if there was a caesarean, there's still water. But you have to be born by the Spirit. You have to come to that place of saying, not me, but Him. I give it all up for Him. Who is Jesus to you? Have you come to that place of being able to say, I am surrendering. As difficult as it, I have not surrendered all. Let's be honest. Because there's still things I want to hold on to. But I'm working on it. And I'll be working on it until the day I die to go home to be with him. But his promises remain real to me. That's why the Bible for me is such an incredible book. And then we have pastors that are recognized as great teachers who say the Bible is no longer relevant. If you're saying the Bible is not relevant, then Jesus is no longer relevant. Because it is the story of Jesus. And so we have to start, I could digress on why we should know the Bible. But we've got to get to this place of saying, do I believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Simply, he came, he died, he rose, he's coming back. 
That's the simplicity of the gospel. We've made it all more complicated. You have to do this and you have to do that and I have to get my life right first and then I can come to church. If you, I can say for a lot of church, if you go to church to find Jesus, he's not there. Jesus would be in the hedgerows, in the byways and looking for people. We have to be equipped to go find them and bring them back in. That's our job, to share the gospel. Who is Jesus to you? John 3 verse 36 says to us that some people are still living with the wrath of God upon them. Is the wrath of God on you? See, if the wrath of God is still on you, it means you haven't made that substitution from wrath to grace. We have to move to that place of saying, without Christ, I am nothing. Without Christ, I'm going to say to you, if you are struggling with something in your life, if you have an addiction and those kind of things, I can almost say to you, without Christ, you are going to struggle. Yes, you can go to, to, to doctors and use medical, that works. But we need to be filled with something that brings us true hope. 1 Peter 1. Christ has given us, let me read it for you quickly, if my eyes will work. Megan, you're in front. You can read out of my Bible. Just that bit in green. Over all the scribbles. Over all the scribbles. <laughs> Don't read the scribbles. Uh, I can't read them anyways. <laughs> okay. Pray, wait, 1 Peter? One. 1. From verse 3. Okay. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perish, perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Amen. Thank you. We live in a time of hopelessness. We have been given hope into a living faith found in Christ Jesus. That passage should, should evoke such anticipation in us that though this side of life I might be without hope, I cannot get out of this. I'm struggling with this. Barry, you don't understand how deep my struggle is. I don't fully understand your struggle, but I know the one who can fix it. I know the one who has said, I brought you into a living hope with a living inheritance that will neither rust nor rot nor fade, protected by God himself. Your salvation is guarded by God himself. Not other people, not angels, not pastors, not elders, not deacons, by God himself. When we step into the realm of God and we say, Lord, not me, but you, take me as I am. I surrender all, forgive me. That is given to us in that instant. Salvation. Christ is imparted into us. His spirit lives within us. And we begin the journey of salvation. That we work out as we work, as we walk, as we journey. God changes us slowly. Doesn't mean he's going to take away your problem straight away. You might have to live with your problem for a while, relying on the power of Christ in your life. Salvation is easy, but very difficult. Who is Jesus to you? Is today not the day where you need to be saying, Lord, I can't anymore. I need to make a choice. I need to make a choice this morning to follow you. Help me in my life. Jesus loves being a crutch. That's my words. He wants to walk with us. He wants to, to hold us up. He want, God wants us, Jesus wants us to be successful. And I'm not saying to be rich and wealthy. He wants us to be successful in our journey with him. People of faith, people of joy, people of hope. Who 
Who is Jesus to you? John 14 says, you know my father, you trusted my father, now trust me. In my father's house there are many rooms. And I'm going there now to prepare a place for you. And when your place is prepared, I will come back to fetch you and take you to be with me. What a promise. For this time now, we're living in a struggle as Megan read. For this time, there will be struggle and trial and tribulation. But our hope is he's preparing a place. Preparing a place. Right now, God is preparing our places. Now, however that looks in your mind, that's fine for you. Just know the hope is that God is busy. Jesus is busy. Jesus is right now interceding at the right hand of God for you and me. Telling God, I know this one. I know this one. I know this one. Rose is going to pray. Lord, I know this one. Can we all say that this morning? Can we say, Jesus, I know who you are to me. I know you. And I always remind us, as Pam says, he says, I know you too. It's no use just knowing God if he doesn't know you. Have we come to a place of saying, Lord, I surrender all. Not my will, but yours be done. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that I need never feel rejected again like I did for most of my life. Thank you that I have somebody who cares for me beyond anything I could ever dream of or imagine. Enough. That one day, there's a picture we used to have in our lounge of a cross. Very trite words, but so true. I asked Jesus, how much does he love me? And he stretched out his hands and said, this much. Then they hit nails through his wrists and his feet and killed him. For you and for me. That we can live free and hopeful not hopeless. The gospel is real. The gospel is the power unto salvation for all men. Romans 1. All men. Jew or Greek. Barbarian. That's who we are, the barbarians. It's for all of us. Who is Jesus to you this morning? A story or your king? The one you can call out to in the middle of the night when you're afraid? Or the one you don't know. I've called out to Jesus many times. And I've yet to be disappointed. He doesn't always answer the way I want him to. But I've never and never will be disappointed by Jesus. Because I belong to him. And yes, he belongs to me. God said to Moses, is my arm too short to save you? Is my arm too short to save you? Wherever you are, whatever you're stuck in, however dark it is right now, he's saying to you, my arm is not too short to save you. The hand is always out. All it takes is for you and I to take it. It's all we have to do. Remember, Pierre said to me this week, it's quite interesting that the way the church has changed, you all looking at me from the cross. We used to look at the cross. Never thought about this. When the cross was on that wall, we all sat here and looked at the cross. Now we've turned. We look from the cross. Because salvation has already been bought. We are free in Christ. Let's not, let's not diminish what Jesus did. Who is Jesus to you this morning. I've probably got to go spend some time in this week myself just reworking that out in my mind. Who is Jesus to me? I can stand up and preach eloquently with great words, but if he's not real to me, then it's just empty words, a resounding gong, a noisy cymbal. So the word says to us, who is Jesus to you this morning? Right. Make an offer to you. If you don't know Jesus, I believe God is saying to us this morning, if you don't know me, today is the day. Every day is the day. 
even as older, mature Christians, every day should be the day we wake up and say, praise the Lord for the gospel. I'm saved because of the gospel. I'm saved because of Jesus. But God is making an offer. I believe the Holy Spirit prompted us this morning not to preach on giving, although the greatest gift ever was Jesus. The greatest sacrificial gift was Jesus. But we can talk about money in a week or two. I believe Jesus is saying, even with the songs that Lynette picked this morning, spoke about Jesus. The offer's been made. The hand is out. Will you accept the offer? I'm not going to give you a promise that it's going to be great. I'm not going to give you a promise there's going to be angels singing on earth here. It does say, though, that when one comes to Christ, the angels sing in heaven at the rejoicing of one more sheep coming home. Maybe it's time to get out of the pig pen and come home. A friend of mine that's passed away now, pastor in America, Pastor Chuck, had one saying it changed his life. He turned his church around from being an orthodox kind of church like this to touching people's lives with some words that God gave him. And he said, God said to him, Daddy's not angry. Come home. Daddy is not angry. Come home. Maybe it's time for you today to come home. Stop eating the pig food and feast at the wedding banquet of the Lamb. If you, if you want me to pray with you, or some, maybe somebody's sitting next to you, and you just say, I need you to pray with me. Ask them. I, I'm going to spring this on the worship team. Can you maybe just play a song for us, surrender all? If you don't mind, Lynette, if she's still here. Just to give us this time, uh, Mark says, and we agree with him not to create the pink fuzzy. This is not an emotional thing. This is about doing business with Jesus. Lord, I need you. I just want them to play a song so you don't feel embarrassed if you need to come to the front. That you don't feel like you're standing here on your own. But I'm making you the offer. If you want somebody to pray with you, I am here. The elders are here. Anybody can pray with you to come to Christ. It's a simple process to start the journey. We start the journey this morning. The offer is being made. Let me pray for you as they set up. Holy Spirit, I, I, I don't know if I've done you justice on your word this morning. But I know that the words of man can never bring anybody to salvation. Great men, women alike, who have become famous, their names will never bring people to salvation. It's only the name of Jesus Christ. It's only in Christ that we find salvation. It is only in Christ that we find fulfillment. It is only in Christ that we find life and life in abundance. It is only in Jesus that we find true hope. Lord, I pray for your people that are sitting here. Many know you, and I'm sure there are others that don't know you, but they are your people. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just move, that you would take those hearts that have been hard for so long, maybe afraid for so long, and you would just break them, as you do, not to cause pain, but to bring healing. I pray that you would clear minds that have been frozen for so long that they have not been. Lord, if you could change Paul, that he would go from Saul to become Paul, a man who killed people for, the, for what he believed to be true, then you can do it for us. Lord, I know if you can change me, you can change anyone. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, open hearts, open minds, open eyes, open ears. I pray even, Lord, that you would move feet. Those feet that are, are feeling leaden right now. That those bodies that don't want to stand because they're afraid. I do not have a spirit of fear, the Lord says. I pray that you would galvanize feet. And even if it's just to turn to the person next to them and say, please pray with me. Help me to see Jesus as he is. The radiance of God's glory.